Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to uh, Sabbath School. Today has been an interest. Today's lesson is a really interesting lesson, and it has made me do a lot of deep thinking and soul searching. So I hope it will have the same outcome for you. But before we get started, Scott, will you pray for us? Sure. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you um, send your Holy Spirit. We invite him to take over our um, our speech for tonight, our talk, that you um, help us to be able to transmit your words and to also follow the example, the, the good example of Abel and the faithful people rather than the um, Cain and um, his descendants. We ask you that you um, give us your strength to follow and to do the right things and uh, we pray for a special blessing for our, each of us here tonight, as well as for everyone listening. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, our memory verse today is, comes to us from Genesis 4-7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So that's pretty deep. If, if we do well, if we follow what God has to say, we're accepted. If not, sin lies at the door. And this was the problem that, that Cain had um, in the story. So in Genesis 4, which is where we're going to spend most of our time today, <laughs> first, the first birth announcing of the messianic salvation and the first act of violence and death happens in this chapter. The events given an idea of what human life will be like after the fall, namely mingling life and death, birth and crime are intertwined. The structure of chapter 4 <clears throat> renders this tension through the form of a chiastic structure altering between birth and crime. But these two brothers, Cain and Abel, represent the whole human family, and we're going to see this in uh, a quotes from Ellen White, and I'm going to paraphrase some of this for you, but there is a good chapter in Signs of the Times, December 23, 1886, where she really goes in detail <clears throat> about um, the differences between Cain and Abel. So they represent the whole family. They were both tested on the point of obedience, and we too are tested on the point of obedience. And all will be tested as they were. Abel bore the proving of God. He revealed the gold of a righteous character, the principles of true godliness. But Cain's religion had not a good foundation. It rested in human merit. So we see this, and we'll, we'll talk more about this whole concept of, of human merit. As far as, as um, secondly, as far as birth and religion instructions were concerned, these brothers were equal. They came from the same parents. And though Cain, being the firstborn, was in some respects a little bit more favored, and we'll learn about why that was in our lesson today, the difference lay in the obedience of one and, not the, and the disobedience of the other. Abel uh, grasped the principles of redemption. He saw himself as a sinner, and he saw a sin and its penalty standing between his soul and communion with God. He brought the slain victim and, sacrifi and sacrificed its life, thus acknowledging the claims of the law which had been transgressed. Through the shed blood, he looked to the future sacrifice, Christ dying on the cross of Calvary and trusting in the atonement that were made that were to be made. He had the witness that he was the righteous offering accepted. Adam taught his children and grandchildren about the fall of men so that they knew they were all taught equally and what the meaning of the sacrificial system was and the, sacri the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. Also in the case of Cain and Abel, <clears throat> we have a type of two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. 
This it, and this type is worthy of close study. And we see that, <clears throat> we see then that after Cain came uh, Seth, and we see God's people, um, we, can see, you, we can see that throughout the Bible in all the begats, if you remember the begats. We see that, that lineage. And we see in the case of Cain, most of the pagan religions were drawn out <clears throat> of, uh, from him. Most of them claim him as the father of their, their um, religions. The Cain class of worshipers include by far the largest number, for every false religion that has been invented has been based on the Cain principle, that man can depend on his own merits and righteousness for salvation. The great controversy from Adam down to our time has been on the point of obedience or opposition to God's law, and every soul will be found on the side of the obedient or the rebellious. Um, so as we begin this chapter <clears throat> with the birth of Cain, and it ends with the, birth, with, the, with the birth of Seth, well, the birth of Cain leads to failure and a, as a limited horizon made of human achievement and violence leading to the flood, the birth of Seth brings repair to the preceding failure and restores God's plan of salvation, leading to the survival of humanity in history and to humanity's salvation. So in Genesis, what follows immediately after the fall, then the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden, are mainly births and deaths, all the fulfillment of God's prophecies from the preceding chapters. So what our lesson does is take a look at these two, um, two chapters, and we can see the, the, the common themes in the words or the descriptions of sin. So Genesis 3, 6 through 8. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took the fruit and ate it. She also gave it to her husband and he ate it. Both their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. So once they had sinned, they, they, they knew their sin. And they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from his presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Now, that this, is, this is a principle that we'll, we see throughout the Bible and we see throughout our own lives, is once we have sinned, there is a separation that comes between us and God. It's not God walking away from us, but us walking away from God. So we see that with Adam and Eve. And now we look at, at um, Genesis 4.8. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Sin pushes us to do things that separates us from God and to do things that we, we normally wouldn't do, as is what happened with, with Cain and Abel. Then we look at Genesis 3.17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten the fruit of the tree, which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil ye shall eat thereof in all the days of your life. Again, we see sin has consequences. In Genesis 4.11, the expulsion, So now you are cursed from earth, which was opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So he, we see now this sin that Cain did in, in Genesis 4. There was a curse and a consequence that went with it. Genesis 3.24, compare with, um, with, with um, is, is also a comparison. So he drove out the man and he placed the cherub in the east of Eden with the flaming sword which turned every way to guard the tree. So he was cast out. And then in Genesis 4.16, when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Of fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Again, Cain was cast out because of his sin. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So we see these parallels throughout these two chapters. The first event after Adam's expulsion, full of hope, 
the birth of their first son, and the event that Eve sees the fulfillment of prophecy as she heard the Masonic, as she heard this Masonic prophecy in Genesis 3.15. Messianic? Messianic, did what I say? Masonic? Messianic, Messianic, sorry. Thank you, Scott. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is, she thought he could be the promised Messiah. The next events, the crime of Cain, the crime of Lamech, the decreasing span of life, and the increasing wickedness are all fulfillment of the curse of Genesis 3. But even through that, hope is not lost. So, Danielle, would you tell, talk to us about Cain and Abel? Sunday's lesson is... Uh, spent in just two, the first two verses of chapter 4 of Genesis. And uh, here starts the story of Cain and Abel. So we'll lay the foundation. So let's read the beginning of this chapter together. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So when we're looking at these texts, what can we see? What jumps at us at first is just some of the, some of the simple things. Cain was born first. Abel was second. Uh, Cain was a tiller of the ground, and Abel, the second born, was a keeper of the sheep. But let's dig a little deeper. As we dig a little deeper, when Cain is born, we see the typical language that we see many times in the Bible. It says that she conceived and bore Cain. Cain, at Quain, uh, as it's written in the original Hebrew, meaning the, name, the meaning of his name is acquire, possess. So the image that we get here is that of an acquired possession, um, a treasure that's really the name that he was given. Also, we see that Eve spoke and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. We can almost see her excitement. It's just like, I have just had a baby. <laughs> um, and, and as the New King James translates, that's how the New King James translates this, this original Hebrew. However, when we look at the original Hebrew, it is different. In the original Hebrew, it, leads, it reads literally, I have gotten a man, the Lord. Not from the Lord. I have gotten a man, the Lord. And not only that, the way the Lord is said, if we remember when we studied the creation accounts a couple of lessons ago at the beginning, the first lesson in, in the, this quarter, we were looking at the creation account took two creation accounts, and in the first creation account, we saw that the name for God was Elohim, which was an image of majesty, grandeur, sort of distant and ma majestic. And then in the second account, we saw that they, the, in the creation story was used both Elohim and Yahweh. Yahweh has a meaning of intimacy, closeness. It's It's meaning the meaning translation would be the Lord, God and the Lord. And uh, we see that in this, particular trans in, in this particular story where she says, I have gotten a man, she uses Yahweh, which is an intimate and close. And when we read this account, we can kind of see what's happening. And when we're reading an Ellen White, we know that we are right in this account. The, as they are looking at this child that they've just had, um, Eve is looking, I have just gotten a child, the Lord. And they are thinking of the uh, Genesis 3.15, where they were made the promise of a Redeemer coming to rescue them from their decision that they had made. And they think that this first child may be the Messiah or the, the, the one sent. Uh, 
And Ellen White says the same as well when we read in Desire of Ages, page 31. Uh, Ellen White interprets by saying, when Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. Oh, the, the plot thickens. We keep on going, and we see that in verse 2, Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, then she bore again, this time her brother Abel. We see the absence of the usual expressions, and she conceived, as it was described at Cain's birth, just one verse before. And, the one, uh, and we just see that she describes, um, you know, the, with this favorite theology, she continued by just giving birth. Some commentators have suggested that Cain and Abel could have been twins, born at the same time. Of course, the text is not conclusive on that. It's a possibility, but it's not clear enough so that we can actually conclude that. Um, the other thing is that we notice that there's, she does not speak at his birth. And Abel's name means vanity and nothingness. It reflects the fact that either her mother, Hope, had already met with disappointment in, either in her elder son or in Abel's, or just maybe human life. She was no longer excited. Like the first birth, we can see her excitement. Uh, you know, first of all, he's named treasured possession. Cain is named treasured possession. Uh, Eve speaks, and she says, the, you know, I have been given a child, the Lord. With Abel's birth, there is no such... Uh, exuberance. She basically is he's named vanity or nothingness. She does not speak. So we can kind of see the contrast between these two births. Cain, born first, received with joy, possible redeemer, Messiah, named as an acquired treasure, possession. Abel, born second, Eve does not speak about his birth, named vapor, vanity, ephemeris. As we know in the stories as it's going to cover, that we're going to cover in the rest of the days this lesson, we know what happens afterwards. We know that Cain actually murders Abel. We also know that uh, in the chapter 4 of Genesis, Abel is seven times called Cain's brother. It's almost like they're trying to emphasize the, the, how terrible of a deed Cain did by murdering his own brother. With that, I'm going to pass it on along. Thank you. Scott, talk to us about the two different offerings. Two different offerings. <clears throat> well, I think that the offerings themselves reveal a great deal about, um, about the, the people doing the offering and also about uh, two different classes that... Um, Barbara alluded to earlier, so we're going to dig into that. So I, I think as a summary, Cain's um, sacrifice was one where Cain was basically uh, implying that he was doing God a favor, whereas Abel's sacrifice showed faith in Christ's um, greater sacrifice for, for us. Um, so it says here, the contrast between Cain and Abel as reflected in their names did not just concern their personalities, it also manifested in their respective occupations. So Cain was a tiller of the ground, a profession that required physical hard work, and was a, uh, while Abel was a keeper of sheep, implying sensitivity and compassion. Uh, so while Cain was a producer of the fruit of the ground, Abel was the keeper of the sheep. So then they're also, um, the Sabbath school also noticing the words that Cain worked to acquire what he could while Abel was keeping the sheep. Um, and then it says in, um, to look in Hebrews 11.4 and Genesis 4.1 through 5, it says, why did God accept Abel's offering and reject Cain's offering? How are, we, how are we to understand what happened here? It says, now Adam knew his, Eve his wife and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord, and she bore again, 
this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And then in Hebrews 11, 4 it says, By faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, uh, and through it, um, and uh, th though it, and through it, though he being dead still speaks. So God testifying of his gifts, and through it, it being dead, it still speaks. So um, then in Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 5, does a nice explanation of this, um, of these verses. It says, Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam, differed widely in character. Abel had a spirit of loyalty to God. He saw justice and mercy in the Creator's dealing with the fallen race and great, gratefully accepted the hope of redemption. Um, but Cain cherished feelings of rebellion and murmured against God because of the curse pronounced upon the earth and upon the human race for Adam's sin. He permitted his mind to run in the same channel that led to Satan's fall, indulging the desire for self-exaltation and questioning the divine justice and authority. So I'm also reminded here of the, the two prayers of the Pharisee and the publican. So in this case, Abel acted more like the publican saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, a sinner, whereas um, Cain had more of the attitude like, well, I've, I've done you this great favor, so you should appreciate it, God. Just kind of like the Pharisee was saying, look at me, I'm not like this riffraff here. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm important. I, I follow your law, so therefore you should honor me. So Christ says basically that only one of those two people went uh, acknowledged by God, and that was the publican and not the person who was full of himself. So uh, it's also ironic from what um, was said earlier uh, in Daniel's lesson that the, though Cain was the um, firstborn and he was expected to essentially be by Eve and Adam um, to be the new deliverer of the race. So, but he ended up being sort of the opposite of that rather than being the deliverer of the race. He was more of a one who brought um, should we say destruction upon the world so the result of God allowing Cain to live was basically the destruction of the world in the flood um, so let's let's keep going here from from um, continue on from patriarchs and prophets these brothers were te were tested as a Adam had been tested before them to prove whether they would believe and obey the word of God they were acquainted with the provision made for the salvation of man and understood the system of offerings which God had ordained. They knew that in these offerings they were to express faith in the Savior whom the offerings typified and at the same time to acknowledge their total dependence on him for pardon. And they knew that by thus conforming to the divine plan for their redemption, they were giving proof of their obedience to the will of God. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins, and they were to show their faith in the blood of Christ as promised atonement by offering the firstlings of the flocks in sacrifice. Besides this, the first fruits of the earth were to be presented before the Lord as a thank offering. Um, and the next part I'm going to skip ahead. It says, Cain came before God with murmuring and infidelity in his heart uh, in regard to the promised sacrifice and necessity of the sacrificial offerings. His gift expressed no penitence for sin. He felt, as many now feel, that it would be an acknowledgement of weakness to follow the exact plan 
marked out, marked out by God of trusting his salvation wholly to the atonement of the promised Savior. He chose the course of self-dependence. He would come in his own merits. He would not bring a lamb and mingle its blood with his offering, but would present his fruits the product of his labor. He presented his offering as a favor done to God through which he expected to secure the divine approval. Cain obeyed in building an altar, obeyed in bringing a sacrifice, but he rendered only a partial obedience. The essential part, the recognition of a need of a redeemer was left out. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go on a little bit of a tangent here because I think it's interesting, which is that um, isn't the ecumenical movement doing essentially the same thing that Cain was doing, which is to say that they're going to acknowledge um, the parts of, of uh, biblical Christianity, but they're going to leave out one essential part, which is that Christ is the only way to get to God. So I think that part is now being left out as it was by Cain. So Cain obeyed in everything except for he actually left out the sacrifice. Um, and he, by this he showed that he was essentially showing contempt for God's plan. So let's keep going. So far as uh, um, birth and religious instruction were concerned, these brothers were equal. Both were sinners and both acknowledged the claims of God to reverence and worship. To outward appearance, their religion was the same up to a certain point, but beyond this, the difference was great. By faith awful offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, Abel grasped the great principles of redemption. He saw himself a sinner, and he saw sin and its penalty, death, standing between his soul and communion with God. He brought the slain victim, the sacrificed life, thus acknowledging the claims of the law that had been transgressed. Through the shedding of blood, he looked for the future sacrifice, that is, Christ dying on the cross of Calvary, and trusting in the atonement that was to be made, that he had the witness that he was righteous and his offering accepted. So Cain had the opportunity of learning and accepting these truths as had Abel. He was not a victim of arbitrary purpose. One brother was not elected to be accepted of God and the other rejected. Abel chose faith and obedience, Cain, unbelief and rebellion. Here the whole ma matter rested. I think this is an interesting statement because it also cuts out um, all of the religions that believe in predestination. So it's basically saying Cain was not predestined to be lost and able to be saved, but rather they made their own choices. So I think there's a lot that rests in these uh, statements. Uh, and then it says Cain and Abel represent two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. One will avail themselves of the appointed sacrifice. Um, okay, let me. One will avail themselves upon the appointed sacrifice for sin, and the other. Um, okay, sorry, I, I got. Uh, all right, um, and the other depend upon their own merits. Theirs is a sacrifice without the virtue of divine mediation, and thus it is, not being able to bring man into favor with God. It is only through the merits of Jesus that our transgression can be pardoned. Those who feel no need for the blood of Christ, who feel that without divine grace they can by their own work secure approval of God, are making the same mistakes as did Cain. If they do not accept the cleansing of the blood, they are under condemnation, and there is no other provision made whereby they can be released from the thraldom of sin. We'll stop there. Thank you. All right, we're going to get into now <clears throat> the crime. And so as we get into the crime, let's read <clears throat> Genesis 4, through 8, 4, 3 through 8. We're going to see how Cain responded to <clears throat> what happened and how God responded to Cain. So, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain 
brought the offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of the flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will... If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, your sin lies at the door. And the desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So God's desire was for Cain to do well, and that he needed to take that control over his will. Now Cain talked with his brother Abel, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So we see a little bit more of this in 1 John 3.12, a little bit further explanation, where it says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, and his brother was righteous. So we see here that a lot of Cain's anger was not with himself. It was because... His brother was righteous, and he knew it, and it it made him angry. And we see two pieces here of this, where he says his countenance fell. So Cain's anger was directed, it appears, to God and to Abel. Cain was angry with God because he thought that he was the victim of an injustice, and angry with Abel because he was jealous of his brother. But jealous of what? Just an offering? Certainly, more was going on behind the scenes. What is revealed in these texts, Cain was depressed because his offering was not accepted. So he was not happy that God wasn't pleased with his offering. So then God asks two questions. Let's look at those questions. He says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? These questions are related to Cain's two conditions. Note that God does not curse Cain as with Adam. God questions not because he doesn't know the answer, but because he wants Cain to look at himself and then understand the reason for his own condition. God does this to us all the time. He wants us to understand our condition, and he does it in gentle ways sometimes. As always, the Lord seeks to redeem his fallen people. After these questions, God counsels Cain. God urges Cain to do well, to behave in the right way. It is a call for repentance and a change of attitude. God promises Cain that he will be accepted and forgiven. In a sense, he is saying that Cain can have the acceptance of God, but it must be done on God's terms and not on Cain's terms. And we see this, we, we see Cain wanting it on his terms. The Lord said to Cain in Genesis 6, what he says indicates that Cain was supposed to respond to God. Yet instead he responded to God, instead of responding to God by faith, he turns and kills his brother. It's significant that Cain's crime and his, Cain's crime immediately follows this shift in dialogue from the failed vertical to the horizontal. The mechanism of the first religious crime is thus suggested. The crimes of zealous ones are not committed because they feel they're right. The crimes of fanaticism, religious intolerance, derive, on the contrary, from failure to respond to God's word. So it's really about... This, this is all, all a spiritual and emotional battle. When faith is replaced by human work and control, crime follows. Cain killed his brother, not because Cain felt he was right and his brother was wrong. And I can't say this too many times, but it, on the contrary, it was because he was evil and his brother was righteous. So God's counsel was revealed the root of sin. It was found in Cain himself. Here again is God counseling Cain and seeking to guide him in the right way. God's second word of counsel concerns his attitude towards sin, 
which lies at the door. The desire is for you, God recommends, self-control. You shall rule over it. It's so important that we get control over self. It's one of the, the, the most difficult sins to get control over. The same principle resonates in James when he explained that each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away from the other's desires and enticed. The gospel offers us the promise not only of forgiveness of sin, but also victory. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 10.13 at that promise. No temptation has overtaken you except is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So what a beautiful promise. This is a promise we can claim every day that God will keep us from temptation and not give us more than we can bear. In the end, Cain had no one to blame but himself. Cain wanted to sacrifice his way. He wanted to be able to come to God on his terms in his own way. How many do that today? Um, one of the most outstanding examples in my mind of this is the Sabbath. The whole world wants to worship God, not on the day that God asked them to do, but in their way. And they believe that in doing so, that it's, it's okay. It's, and, and we see here for Cain, it wasn't okay. But we don't need to look just to the outside when it comes to the Sabbath. We, need to, we can look inside in our own group as well. I was, I was sitting and thinking, God... Am I keeping the Sabbath the way you want me to keep the Sabbath? Am I really turning my time over to you? Am I not buying and selling? Am I really <clears throat> focused on you and on your word? Am I keeping the Sabbath based on what I, my, my conscience? Or am I ba keeping the Sabbath based on your word? And so I would like us to consider, as we go through this lesson, I mean, I think it's something that we all need to ponder, is are we doing it our way, or are we doing it God's way? Danielle. Wednesday. So Wednesday, we're looking at the punishment for Cain's deed. And we're spending... Uh, the, our time in Genesis continuing in chapter 4, verses 9 through 16. So let's read that part together and then unpack it. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. I, am I my brother's keeper? We can see his attitude. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. We have a lot to cover. Mm. So here we go, we know what's happened. We've just covered that. And God comes to Cain, just like he came to Adam and Eve. And he prompts them with a question. And he says, Abel, where is your brother? Where is your brother Abel? Uh, Cain, where is your brother Abel? And as with Adam and Eve, God sought to make him acknowledge his guilt. And we saw that Adam and Eve, while they did blame each other, they acknowledged their deed. They did say, well, I did it, but I did it because, and so on and so forth. 
but there's a completely different situation with Abel. Abel just completely denies it. Um, he is just not even, it's just vastly different attitude. He boldly, he just boldly denies it. Uh, and he, so in a way to his initial guilt of murdering now, he's just added falsehood. But the Lord is not fooled. He knows. I mean, he's the one that knows when a sparrow falls. So he says, what have you done? Uh, and uh, proceeds to charge him. Uh, it's just, in, what have you done implies his perfect knowledge. God knew exactly what he had done. And it, then he continues to say, the voice of thy brother's blood is crying out to me. Um, an all-seeing, all-knowing God just reading his naked soul, just opening it up completely. Um, and, I mean, basically, Abel was the first martyr. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it was, he was the first martyr on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, blood is life, and such is precious to the Lord. And we see that in Psalm 116, 15, uh, Psalm chapter 116, verse 15, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Abel's life was very precious to the Lord. I'm sure that the Lord was very pained to see that uh, happening. Um, but then continuing, in Genesis 9-4, it says, But you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. Why? The blood of Abel, I mean, God not, doesn't just say, Abel is dead, he also says, the blood cries out to me, because to God, blood is, is, is sacred, and as a result, he did, uh, you know, he told the Israelites not to eat blood, because it said, do not eat flesh with its life, that is the blood, so life equals blood, or blood equals life, whichever way we want to put it. And then continuing, um, let's look at Hebrews 11.4, which is in the New Testament, and it talks about Abel's death. It says, and, and his uh, sacrifice. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Because he obeyed God, like Barbara had pointed out, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. So, he, this, his, even though he's dead, his actions are still a witness to us today that he was uh, faithful. Abel, Abel met with his death at the, cane, at the hand of his brother, a close family member. Similarly, Jesus, when he came to this earth, he also came to his death from uh, his creation, in a way, family members as well. Uh, and he was rejected and sent to his death by his brethren. Uh, we can see kind of a parallel there. Now art thou cursed. We can see there was a divine curse placed on, uh, on, on, on Cain, and he is now going to be banished. Uh, to a less fertile region. He's, um, the ground that he's going to till, I mean, it's kind of tough. He was a tiller of the ground. If you're, if you're doing tilling of the ground and now all of a sudden you have to run and be a fugitive, uh, it's, you're not going to be as productive. It's going to be a much harder life. And on top of that, the earth is not going to yield. It's as if the blood that was shed, it's as if like the earth is now revolting against him. And we can see a similar parallel, you know, God talks about that kind of stuff in Leviticus chapter 18, 28, where he's talking about the Canaanites having done abominations in the earth and then the earth spilling them out. So here we go, Leviticus chapter 18, 27 to 28. For all these abominations the men of the land have done, talking about the Canaanites, who were before you, talking to the Israelites, and thus the land is defiled lest the land vomit you out also when you defile it. In other words, don't do like them, or the land is going to spit you out as well, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. So the idea is like uh, the earth is revolting, the God's creation is revolting against the horror of the murder that 
uh, Cain did. Greater than I can bear. So he is complaining now and saying, this is greater than I can bear. Um, but it's sending, we can see the difference. Instead of repenting, Cain is basically giving more attitude and more rebellion, kind of like he's saying, you're unfair, God. Does it sound like Satan? God's not fair. Very similar. And then he, we see also that the Lord puts a sign on him uh, that, to protect him. And also protection that if he is m murdered, there would be retribution seven times. Seven times is a very strong uh, retribution. In other words, God will perfectly protect him. It's a temporary protection. The mark that is on him is a temporary protection. Now Cain went out. He felt neither remorse nor repentance, but only the heavy burden that, of God's displeasure. He left the divine presence probably never to return, and began his life as a wanderer in the land of Nod, to the east of Eden. And we can see that uh, he's a wandering flight exile. It became the, the home of the descendants of Cain in that area. What a big difference between him and we think of other people in the Bible. I mean, David. David had, did a heinous crime, but his words still speak to us today. It's one of those texts in the Bible that we love to go to. So I'm going to read them to you because this is the difference for any one of us that have fallen because we are not greater than Cain in many respects, but we can choose like David to repent. And that's the key. So let's read together Psalm 51, 1 to 2. Have mercy. David cries out to the Lord after he is murdering his general and after he slept with Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. He's admitting. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And then he goes on in verses 7 and 9 of the same chapter. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop is what they used to use in the sanctuary to cleanse and spread the blood of the cleansing blood of the Lord. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. And in verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, Scott, tell us what about Cain's lineage and what happens with the wickedness of his lineage? Well, it's certainly a very interesting lesson. I think this one could also be entitled Going from Bad to Worse. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's open up with uh, the, the Genesis 4, 17 through 24. It says, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and they built a city, uh, the name of which was called after the name of his son, Enoch. And to Enoch was born Erod, and to Erod begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methushael, Methushael begot Lamech. And Lamech took for himself two wives, the name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jubal, and Jubal was the father of those... Um, who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name, uh, or Jabal, and his brother's name was Jubal. And he was the father of those who play the harp and the flute. As for Zillah, she also bore, bore Tubal Cain, the instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech. Listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech shall be avenged seventy-sevenfold. So, anyway, from this, I think what, it, what we're seeing here is a, a pattern of going from um, bad to worse. So essentially it says that... Um, while Cain asks for God's mercy, Lamech is not recorded as asking for it. While Cain is avenged seven times by God, Lamech believes he will be avenged 77 times. 
a hint that he's very much aware of his guilt. Also Cain is monogamous, whereas Lamech introduces polygamy, for the scripture specifically says that he took for himself two wives. He was the first polygamist. That's right. And um, this seems like he was doing this even further to defy God. So God, you said this, but I'm going to do this. Um, so uh, let's read a little bit now more from, I really like the chapter in Patriarchs and Prophets, so I'm going to keep reading from it. Um, it says, The murder of Abel was the first example of the enmity that God had declared would exist between the serpent and the seed of the woman, between Satan and his subjects, and Christ and his followers. Through man's sin, Satan had gained control of the human race, but Christ would enable them to cast off his yoke. Whenever through faith in the Lamb of God, a soul renounces the service of sin, Satan's wrath is kindled. The holy life of Abel testified against Satan's claim that it is impossible for man to keep God's law. When Cain, moved by the spirit of the wicked one, saw that he could not control Abel, he was so enraged that he destroyed his life. And wherever there are any who will stand in vindic vindication of the righteousness of the law of God, the same spirit will be manifested against them. It is the spirit that through all ages has set up the stake and kindled the burning pile for the disciples of Christ. But the cruelties heaped upon a follower of Jesus are instigated by Satan and his hosts because they cannot force him to submit to their control. It is the rage of a vanquished foe. Every martyr of Jesus has died a conqueror, says the prophet. They overcame him, that is the old serpent called the devil and Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they lo loved not their lives unto death. So it says, notwithstanding that Cain by his crimes had merited the sentence of death, a merciful creator spared his life and granted him opportunity for repentance. But Cain lived only to harden his heart, to encourage rebellion against the divine authority, and to become the head of a line of bold, abandoned sinners. This one apostate, led on by Satan, became a tempter to others, and his example and influence uh, exer exerted their demoralizing power until the earth became so corrupt and filled with violence as to call its destruction. In sparing the life of the first murderer, God presented before the whole universe a lesson bearing upon the great controversy. The dark history of Cain and his descendants was an illustration of what would have been the result of permitting the sinner to live on forever to carry out his rebellion against God. The forbearance of God only rendered the wicked more bold and defiant in their iniquity. Fifteen centuries after the sentence was pronounced upon Cain, the universe witnessed the fruition of his influence and example and the crime and pollution that flooded the earth. It was made manifest that the sentence of death pronounced upon the fallen race for the transgression of God's law was both just and merciful. The longer men lived in sin, the more abandoned they became. The divine sentence cutting short a career of unbridled iniquity and freeing the world from the influence of those who had become hardened in rebellion was a blessing rather than a curse. Um, so it's also interesting here, I, I also looked up some other commentaries to look in, a little bit more into Lamech. So, um, so in, in this it's also interesting that it kind of gave me the idea of that all of the ancient gods seem to be sort of based on um, these traits. So uh, the, um, the musician, the metal worker, um, so, like, if we think about it, wasn't there Pan was one of the ancient Greek gods who was a god of music, mm -hmm. and then I think there was a separate god who had to do with metallurgy, so it seemed like a lot of the... They had gods for everything. They, they did. Um, so, um, it's also interesting that 
whereas um, Cain would be avenged seven times, Lamech says he's going to be avenged 77 times, which also kind of brought, in, uh, brought to mind the idea of 70 times 7, because that was the number of times Christ told Peter he should forgive. Mm -hmm. So it seems like Christ went another order of magnitude past the, the, uh, the 70 times 7. And here's another interesting thing that I, I don't actually have an explanation of it, but the namesake of Lamech, so the, the one on the, so there were two Lamechs and two Enochs, mm -hmm. one on the good line and one on the bad line, but the um, Lamech in the good line actually lived 777 years, and he was the shortest lived um, of the people before the flood. So his father, Methuselah, lived 969 years, which was the longest one, and he only lived 777 years. So um, anyway, I, I'm not sure exactly what the 777, the significance of that is, but I think that could be a, stu a subject of further study. However, I think what... Seven, it, seven is God's number of perfect fulfillment. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also interesting is the name of the meaning of the name um, Lamech. And I think one of them became, uh, one of them can mean powerful and the other version of the name could mean poor and made low. So it almost seems like the powerful and the poor and made low would be the opposite. So um, Lamech who thought he was powerful, that is the descendant of Cain, the seventh from Cain was made poor and low whereas the other Lamech from the, um, the, from the line of the godly men um, ended up being powerful because he was the father of uh, Noah who was the father of the faithful who then continued on. Um, so I think in conclusion what I wanted to say about this is that um, it's, it's also interesting to see how the evil traits of character of one man seem to have been passed on not to just him but to an entire um, fairly large portion of the human race and even their daughters, uh, the daughters of men contaminated the sons uh, of God and so that the entire world basically became wicked through the sin of one man whom God could have destroyed, but had God destroyed Cain at the beginning, just like the destruction of Satan at the beginning would have not appeared to be a good thing. It would have appeared to be arbitrary on the part of God. Um, so God allowed Cain to live to show why allowing murderers and people who are rebellious against God, why allowing them to live is not a good thing. Anyway, we'll end there. Okay. Daniel. <clears throat> Some what are your final thoughts? Um, I was thinking a lot about Cain and Abel. It's not something I think often of. It's like we think a lot of other people in the Bible, but we just don't think back to Cain and Abel. But as we entered this world, we all have, there are expectations that are placed on us. Just as they were on Cain and Abel, we can see the expectations that Eve and Adam had for him, thinking that he may be the redeemer. And then we saw, and naming him treasured possession, and then we saw the disappointment that they seemed to have in Abel, uh, naming him vanity and uh, vapor. However, so there are expectations like on all, on all of us from different people in our lives when we enter this world and as we move through life. However, our eyes are to be placed on the Lord just like Abel's were, and to, we are to obey him in every aspect, just like Abel did. Cain looked to himself instead as the designer of his own life, following his own desires. And we saw where it led him. It's similar for us. That's a very apropos lesson. Given the opportunity of repent repentance, he just plain rejected it boldly and just with pride. There still was hope for him, but yet he rejected it. We are to use this as a clear lesson for our own lives, even if we fall like Cain. Um, 
we are not to follow his example to the end, but rather accept God's stretched out hand of forgiveness. Uh, and his questions, when we feel that question coming from the Lord, it's to wake us up as he was trying to do with Adam and Eve as, and as he was trying to do with Cain. And true repentance comes from the heart. Let's, let's say like David, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. And let's say like him, blot out my transgressions and wash me as white as snow. Thank you. My final thoughts are, going, are coming from Conflict and Courage by Ellen White. It is claimed by some that the human race is in need, not of redemption, but of development, that it can refine, elevate, and regenerate itself. Have you heard that? I've heard that. As Cain thought to secure the divine favor by an offering that lacked the blood of sacrifice, so do these expect to exalt humanity to the divine standard, independent of the atonement. The history of Cain shows what must be, what must be the result. It shows what man will become apart from Christ. Humanity has no power to regenerate itself. And we see that happening in the world today, don't we? It does not tend upward toward the divine, but downward towards the satanic. Christ is our only hope. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this lesson of Cain and Abel today, Lord. We pray that our sacrifice will be the sacrifice chosen by you, that we will be willing to follow whatever you have in store for us, wherever you have in store for us, that you will lead us, that you will guide us, and show us how to live closer to you, how to live a life like you, Lord, how to be an example to others on this earth as you were an example. So we pray, Lord, that we take these principles, these cautions that we've learned from today's lesson, and incorporate them in our daily walk. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today and hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.